Welcome to Food for Thought. My name is Colleen Patrick Goudreau from Compassionate Cooks. I founded Compassionate Cooks to empower people to make informed food choices and to debunk myths about vegetarianism and animal rights. I do this through cooking classes, an online cookbook, lectures and workshops, articles and essays, this podcast, a cooking DVD, and a cookbook called The Joy of Vegan Baking. You can learn more about who we are and what we do by visiting www.compassionatecooks.com and www.joyofveganbaking.com. Hi, everybody. I hope you're all doing well. Thank you, as always, to those who have sent me emails and letters. You make my day so much brighter with your sweet words and your stories of transformation. I'm always touched that you take the time to share these with me. And just know that if I haven't replied yet, I do intend to. Your email may be unanswered as of yet, but it is certainly not forgotten. I've heard from a couple of people who don't use iTunes to download the podcast, and these people have told me that other podcatchers may not be updating the feed very often, or at least regularly or often enough. So if a couple of weeks go by and you don't see a new podcast, something's wrong because new episodes go out every week. If you want to guarantee that you find out about new episodes when they come out, then I suggest you go to CompassionateCooks.com, click on Listen to Our Podcast, and when you get to my feed burner page, You'll see the list of all of the episodes, the names and the descriptions. Just click on subscribe by email under any of the episode descriptions. This way, you'll actually get an email as soon as a new episode is uploaded. And anybody can do this, obviously, not just those who don't use iTunes. And as usual, I do encourage you to subscribe to the podcast, not just download individual episodes, not just download individual files. One other quick thing, to those of you who purchase or even receive as a gift the Joy of Vegan Baking Cookbook, may I request that you take a few minutes to go to Amazon.com and write a quick review. Whether or not you shop there or support Amazon or buy the book from there, a review on Amazon.com helps the book immensely. Visit my Food for Thought blog, which you can find at CompassionateCooks.com, and check out my list of 10 ways you can help the cookbook succeed. I really appreciate any help you can give me. Grassroots marketing is a wonderful and obviously inexpensive way to spread the word about the joy of eating and living vegan, but I do need your help, and I appreciate it very much. This kind of thing helps so much, and it only takes a few minutes. Anyway, moving on, I'd like to send out a thank you to today's sponsor, Kimberly Romer Granger. Kimberly not only sponsored this podcast with a one-time contribution, she also turned right around and became a monthly sponsor also. So thank you, Kimberly, for that. Thank you very much. She also wrote me a very touching email, and we've been in touch ever since, and it's always a pleasure to hear from her. She wrote, I am writing this email to you today, even though I'm at work and should be doing other things. We won't tell anybody, Kimberly. I think about the animals every day, and I want so much to help them. I've learned to rely on your podcast as a way to soothe my aching heart. Each time I launch the podcast and begin to hear the music, I feel soothed and start to feel less overwhelmed and start to feel hopeful. So thank you for that. My journey has been good, and I'm on my path toward eliminating all animal products from my diet. I'm reading and learning how to feed myself and have been successful in learning every day. I have even managed to feed a few of my friends some vegetarian chili, soy-based ice cream, and other meals that I never thought they would try or enjoy. My brother-in-law now says he'll feed his children the non-dairy desserts, so I'm trying to plant my seeds, speak my truth, and advocate for the animals. Thank you for your help in my journey. You have been my guiding voice ever since I made my commitment to give up eating all land animals. I keep your kind and steady voice in my head as I meet my daily challenges. Without you and your commitment to the animals, I wouldn't have had the guts to start down this road. This is what I mean by the overwhelmingly beautiful and open and kind and generous voices out there. I've heard from a number of people who comment on the articulateness of my listeners, and I couldn't agree more. You are a sophisticated and highly evolved group out there. I'm so impressed, and I'm so moved by you. So thank you, Kimberly, and all of the sponsors and subscribers and listeners. If you would like to support this work, please visit www.compassionatecooks.com and click on support this podcast. On behalf of the animals, I thank you. 
So it looks like I'll be doing this podcast well into my old age because my list of topics is so long and each topic that I plan to cover is as important as the next. I love getting your suggestions, some of which are on my list already, some of which are not, but don't hesitate to send me suggestions anyway because when I see that a number of people are struggling with similar challenges, I do tend to move that topic to the top of my queue. I've been getting a lot of requests lately for suggestions for raising vegan children, transitioning non-vegetarian children to veganism and all the various issues that come up during this process and in this way of living. I hate to keep saying I'll cover that in a future episode. So I won't say that right now, but what I do want to say is that today I want to talk about an aspect of being a joyful vegan in a non-vegan world, and that includes issues that come up for parents of vegan children. So with this episode today, I'm able to cut two carrots with one knife. A favorite comment I received lately was from a very sweet podcast listener who said, this was a little while ago, that when she saw that one of the episodes was on teen vegetarianism, she wasn't going to listen because it's not relevant for her. But she listened anyway, and she got a lot out of it. So I do hope that you find this is the case with all of these episodes, that they're for everyone, that you can use the suggestions that seemingly relate to only one segment of the population, but in reality apply to everyone everywhere. That's my hope, at least. So now today's topic is broad, and there's no way I can make it comprehensive in the space and time we have here. So I'm sure we'll flesh it out, as it were, in a future episode, though I do plan on talking at length about certain specific holidays, including Thanksgiving, and those that revolve around food and how to cope and what to cook and how to navigate the tricky waters of Family dynamics and expectations. Today, I want to paint with a broader brush. What I'd like to do, my intention for this episode, is to take a look at the traditions of a few different holidays, just a few, and examine how we can honor the deeper meaning of these holidays while still honoring our ethics and our values. My hope is that you'll come to see that many of our traditions are based on just rituals and symbols whose deeper significance can still be felt when no animals are harmed. In fact, the significance is often greater, in my opinion, when the rituals and symbols are replaced with those that seek to find meaning without harming anyone in the meantime. So let's start with Thanksgiving. And again, I'm going to come back to this in another episode. Now, I am aware that many of my listeners are not North Americans, and North Americans are the ones who who celebrate this holiday. But as I just said before, stay with me and try to apply what I'm saying here to similar situations or holidays that are native to your country and specific to your background. Now, in terms of the Thanksgiving in the United States, which is celebrated on the 4th Thursday in November, I will tell you right now that I'm not interested in the exact menu of the 52 English colonists of 1621 who gathered for a three-day feast along with 90 Wampanoag Indians to celebrate their first autumn harvest. For them, for all of these people, it was a celebration of food and feasting, and for the pilgrims, who were good Christians, praising God, and for the Wampanoags, a time for giving thanks to the earth, a time to honor the three sisters, otherwise known as beans, corn, and squash. You know, these 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 harvests, these autumn harvest vegetables are called the three sisters, beans, corn, and squash. In fact, in the culture of the Wampanoag Indians, who inhabited the area around Cape Cod, Thanksgiving, the idea of giving thanks for their sustenance, was an everyday activity. Every time someone picked a plant, or hunted or fished, they would offer a prayer or acknowledgement. Though for the Wampanoag Indians, this would have been an everyday occurrence for the 52 colonists who had experienced a year of disease and hunger and frustration, their bountiful harvest was a real cause for celebration, a cause to give thanks. And I know a lot of people have spent a lot of time trying to determine what exactly was served on that first Thanksgiving, and they often use this as a justification for eating certain things on this holiday. For me, I don't care, because for me, it doesn't matter. Much of what we know about this first Thanksgiving and much of what informs our consciousness about this Thanksgiving 
holiday is myth, a romanticized notion rather than informed facts, which is fine. I mean, it's fine to use myth to create rituals and traditions. But the point I want to make is that I think it's important to understand that we pick and choose all the time what we want to believe, what we want to honor, and what we want to remember. Our cultural and personal traditions are incredibly selective. So to argue that it's traditional, for example, to serve dead turkeys at Thanksgiving is an example of a selective tradition where we pick out that one element we want to carry on because we want to have dead turkeys on our table at Thanksgiving or whatever the tradition. The point is we, we've picked out that element because that's what we want to carry on. And though I really don't think it matters what animals they ate, I do think it's worth pointing out the fact that everything historians know today about the first Thanksgiving is based on two passages written by colonists. One is a letter dated December 1621. Now remember that um, that the first Thanksgiving was in November of 1621. Uh, so this letter was dated December 1621. And it was by Edward Winslow. And in this letter he wrote... Here's what he wrote. This is quoting the letter. Our harvest being gotten in, our governor sent four men on fowling, that so we might, after a more special manner, rejoice together after we had gathered the fruit of our labors. That's the basis of what we know about that first Thanksgiving. And you'll note what he says. I think it's so interesting. He wrote, our harvest being gotten in after gathering the fruit of our labors, you know, after picking the harvest. So our harvest being gotten in, they sent four men on fowling, which means hunting after birds, not because they were starving or needed it or didn't have food, but so that they, quote, might after a more special manner rejoice together. What they were rejoicing was the food they did have. What they were rejoicing was the harvest, the abundance of fruits and vegetables, the bounty of the harvest, the cornucopia, the horn of plenty. And just to cap it off, they went out to hunt birds. So, I mean, people who say like, oh, but they were starving and you can't blame them for wanting to have the bird. Seems to me they weren't starving. Seems to me the whole point was that they were celebrating the harvest and they went out and got these birds just to make it a more special occasion. I just think that's interesting. Just pointing it out. In a second account of the first Thanksgiving, William Bradford wrote a book 20 years after the actual event. And in this book, he just mentioned that the colonists killed wild turkeys during the autumn. He doesn't say specifically that wild turkeys were killed for the first Thanksgiving or any similar event thereafter. He just says that during the autumn, the colonists killed wild turkeys. And though his book does give clues to what was on the first menu, his book disappeared for many, many, many years. It was stolen by British looters during the Revolutionary War, and it didn't reappear until 1854. So this book did not have any influence on how Thanksgiving was celebrated for many, many years. It's most likely that the animals that were unnecessarily killed for that first Thanksgiving feast were ducks and geese and most likely various kinds of fish. If cranberries were served, they would have been used for their tartness or their color, certainly not in the form we eat it today. It would be 50 more years before berries were boiled with sugar and they most certainly didn't have cranberry sauce in a mold from a can. Potatoes would not have been eaten. Neither the sweet potato nor the white potato was yet available to colonists. And it is most likely that the presence of pumpkin pie is just part of our romanticized myth, too. It's unlikely they would have had ingredients, including flour and butter, for pie crust or even an oven in which to bake it. Squashes native to New England were most likely present. So does that mean you shouldn't have sweet potatoes or rutabagas or mashed potatoes or pumpkin pie or cranberry sauce or flour-based biscuits or any of the things that were not on the table of the first Thanksgiving? No, I point this out merely to emphasize that we selectively choose what to celebrate and what to include, and that if we think we're being true to some sacred tradition, we're kidding ourselves. We serve what we serve because that's what we were taught. That's what we've always enjoyed, and that's what we've always known. The emotional attachment goes far beyond any rational attachment, which is fine, but let's not confuse them. Let's not justify the use of something like dead turkeys at Thanksgiving with any kind of rational explanation or historical reference. It's not there. We choose turkeys because that's what we were taught. And we choose turkeys because of Sarah Josepha Hale.
but you will have to wait to hear more about her when I do an episode specifically on Thanksgiving. And that episode, I'll talk more about Thanksgiving menus um, and more about how contrived our Thanksgiving traditions are. And again, contrived Thanksgiving traditions, it's fine. I'm not saying anybody should not have contrived Thanksgiving traditions. I'm just saying they're contrived. And, and I think it's just worth being aware of that. So you get the idea. I mean, we decide what traditions we want to follow and which ones we want to leave behind. That's the beauty of living and breathing and choosing and growing and learning and evolving. We continually make new choices and better choices and more compassionate choices once we know better. Because of the commercialization of Thanksgiving, yes, the commercialization, we don't usually hear about it like that, but Thanksgiving was commercialized. And again, you'll have to wait for another episode to hear more about that. Um, but because of the commercialization of Thanksgiving, We've completely lost sight of what this holiday really could be about, really should be about, really was about back in 1621. Instead, we turn this into a holiday of gluttony and we act like it's not really Thanksgiving until we're so full that we literally can't move off the couch and we retreat there to watch the Macy's parade or the football game which is fine, but perhaps it would be more meaningful for us if we created new traditions or continue old ones that bring us closer to each other and to the earth and to the abundance that we have. And we have to decide what those rituals would be, but we're certainly not flying in the face of tradition by leaving dead turkey off the table. So let's create new traditions and continue old ones while reframing what Thanksgiving really is and really and really ought to be and, and how it's meaningful for us. Now, this also goes for the Canadian Thanksgiving, which is a three-day affair traditionally celebrated on the second Monday in October. Thanksgiving in Canada corresponds to the English and Continental European Harvest Festival, where churches are decorated with cornucopias and pumpkins and corn and wheat sheaves and other harvest bounty. And English and European harvest hymns are sung on the Sunday of Thanksgiving weekend. During church services, biblical stories relating to the Jewish harvest festival Sukkot are told. Sukkot is a holiday that almost immediately follows Yom Kippur and goes for a week. On Sukkot, uh, that's S-U-K-K-O-T, Sukkot, Jews build a temporary structure called a sukkah made of natural elements in their yards, and they eat and they sleep and they spend time in these sukkahs for a week. It's a holiday filled with plants and fruit and a connection to nature, and it's customary to decorate the sukkah with plants and fruit and vegetables or pictures of such. So whatever your background, it's pretty clear that autumn is the time of year to celebrate the bounty of the harvest, to be close to nature, to be thankful for nature's gifts and to be connected to the earth and the changing of the seasons. And we'll talk more about this another time. Another holiday connected to the autumn and the harvest, a holiday sacred to the ancient Celts, is called Samhain. It's pronounced Samhain, but it's spelled S-A-M as in mom, H-A-I-N, Samhain. And its roots can be found in our modern day Halloween and in the Catholic holiday All Souls Day. The festival of Samhain is a celebration of the end of the harvest. And the term Halloween is a word that has been shortened from all hallow even um, as it's the evening before all hallows day right so hallow even halloween and all hallows day is also known as all saints day in the catholic tradition hallow means holy Many European cultural traditions hold that Halloween is one of the times of the year when spirits can make contact with the physical world. And this is also seen in the Mexican holiday, the Day of the Dead, or Dia de los Muertos, whose emphasis is on honoring the lives of those who died and celebrating the continuation of life. Halloween is still very popular in Ireland where, and I'm going to read a little bit of this just straight from Wikipedia because they just phrase it well, and um, this is where adults and children dress up as creatures from the underworld like ghosts and ghouls and zombies and witches and goblins, and they light bonfires. Halloween was perceived as the night during which the division between the world of the living and the other world was blurred, so spirits of the dead and inhabitants from the underworld were able to walk free on the earth. It was necessary to dress as a spirit or otherworldly creature when venturing outdoors in order to blend in. The children knock on the neighbor's doors in order to gather fruit and nuts and sweets for the Halloween festival. The houses are frequently adorned with pumpkins or turnips carved into scary faces, and lights or candles are sometimes placed inside the carvings to provide an eerie effect. Sound familiar? 
The traditional Halloween cake, there is a traditional Halloween cake in Ireland, and it's called the Barmbrack. I'm probably butchering the pronunciation. I'm sure I am, so forgive me, but it's a fruit bread, and each family member gets one slice of this fruit bread. Games are often played, including bobbing for apples, and I encourage you to check out um, Robert Burns' poem, Halloween. Robert Burns was one of Scotland's great poets, perhaps Scotland's greatest poet, and he's certainly considered the national poet there, and his poem, Halloween, details a lot of the rituals and rites that take place during Halloween in the Celtic traditions. Also, if you do like Celtic literature and folklore as much as I do, then I encourage you also to check out the plays and poems of William Butler Yeats, certainly one of my favorite poets. One of the things that we do on Halloween, we're total dorks, I know, so just whatever. We read um, literature, either classic horror literature or poems and stories with some friends, and we just we light candles and we and we light the fireplace and we take turns reading stories to each other, and it's really it's really quite mood evoking. I really love um, what it does. So anyway, so you now you know what I do on Halloween and you can read some of these um, poets um, and some of your own stories, but you can do whatever you want. You don't have to read, read poetry. So Halloween is still popular in, in other countries, including Scotland and, and Wales and England, and of course in Canada and the U.S. And we have the Scottish and the Irish to thank for Halloween coming to the United States, though it did not become an official holiday here until the 19th century, and it did not become commercialized until the 20th century. And our celebration of the commercialized version of Halloween is what I shall turn to next. Halloween is a holiday that revolves around food, albeit junk food, and this is where I think some vegan parents feel challenged. Some people think that this is a holiday only for kids, and like I said, I disagree because it really is my favorite holiday. This really is my favorite time of the year, the autumn. And I know the holiday does have a lot to do with kids, though. The Halloween that kids know and love centers around costumes and parties and candy, and for those who are still doing it, trick-or-treating. Things are very different than when I was little. We used to trick-or-treat for hours and hours, and that doesn't seem to be the case much these days. So we would just trick-or-treat you know, all night, though I actually would stop at every house and try to eat the candy. I couldn't wait until we got home. My sister was methodical, and she had to hit like every house that she could hit, and I didn't have the patience. I just wanted to sit down because I got tired, and I wanted to eat my candy So, because I had a lot of candy in the pillowcase. you know, We had pillowcases. We didn't have like these fancy Halloween bags and Halloween pumpkin plastic stuff. We had pillowcases. And it was a great way to carry a lot of candy. It was a great way to hold a lot of candy. Um, anyway, so, so, so let's get to the heart of this topic. The heart of this topic is candy. What about candy? Many parents feel like their vegan kid would be deprived and not get to participate in trick-or-treating because they're vegan. Au contraire. It turns out that a lot of candy given out during Halloween is vegan. It's crap, but it's vegan crap. And let's not kid ourselves. It's crap. The candy's crap. So your kid can be a normal kid just like everyone else and get to eat crap. PETA, people, people for the ethical treatment of animals, PETA has a list of vegan candy on their website. The current URL is www.petakids.com, P-E-T-A-K-I-D-S.com, petakids.com slash candy.html. But if that URL changes over time, just type in vegan candy into any search engine and you'll find this list. I won't read off the whole list here, but some of the more popular, more common candy that is vegan includes Blow Pops, Cracker Jacks, Dots, Airheads Taffy, Hubba Bubba Bubblegum, Jolly Ranchers, Juju Bees, Mary Janes, Pez, Now and Later, Sour Patch Kids, Swedish Fish, Sweet Tarts, and Twizzlers, all vegan, all corn syrup. So you can also have non-sugar snacks, also like Fritos and potato chips and nuts and pretzels and Triscuits and Wheat Thins and all types of other things. Those candies that are not vegan, but you're not sure why they're not vegan, usually contain some kind of animal byproduct, some things to look for. And this is not just the case in the case of Halloween candy. I mean, people have been asking me to talk more about hidden ingredients. And here are the big ones. These are the ingredients to look for that are derived from animals, dead animals. So these things include casein, and you should know a lot about casein from our Life After Cheese and our All About Tofu episodes. Gelatin, which you should know by now is the boiled remains of slaughtered animals. Lard, which is animal fat. Rennet, 
which again, you've learned about in the tofu episode, pepsin. Pepsin comes from pigs' stomachs, stearic acid, which is another kind of fat from slaughtered animals and also euthanized dogs and cats, and urea, which comes from urine and other bodily fluids. So these are some of the ingredients you may see on candy and other processed foods. Now you can see why I prefer whole foods. Now you can see why I'm vegan. <laughs> A friend of my husband, uh, it was a coworker of his. He was a non, he was non-vegetarian, but when David told him about, um, I cannot remember the name right now. Basically, it's a red dye that they use for certain processed, again, kind of you know junk food that is basically created by by grinding up beetles, and you get this red you know, you get this red substance and it's added to things like cranberry juice, certain kinds of cranberry juice. This, and this coworker of David's used to g get this juice from the vending machine or something. And when he found out that it was actually from beetles, from insects, he was so grossed out and he did not want to drink this juice anymore, but he still continued eating animals. It was so interesting what actually affects people. I think eventually he stopped eating land animals, but I think he still eats fishes. But anyway, isn't it interesting? I think it's very interesting when you start to talk about things like casein or gelatin. People are so offended and so disgusted by gelatin, but they're still eating the animals themselves. So just another point of observation. Anyway, before I say more about candy and, and vegan candy, I want to say something about what it means to communicate the vegan message to your child. This applies whether you raise your children vegan from the start or whether you transition them at a later time. And though transitioning them later has a few challenges because they've already developed habits and their palates are already used to the fat and salt in animal products, kids get it. They just get it. If you just talk to them and tell them the truth and just as I suggested to teenagers who want their parents to accept their choice to be vegan, be consistent. You as the parent need to be consistent. If you've raised your child as a consumer of animals and their secretions and are now not eating them anymore, all you need to do is be consistent and truthful. Talk to them about what it means for you as an individual and as a family to be vegan, to make kind, compassionate choices. And depending on their age, you can read them books. You can show them age-appropriate videos. You can encourage them to talk to you about how they feel about animals and why they don't want to hurt them. You can encourage them to write their own stories or draw their own pictures. There are many wonderful resources out there and two websites, I guess three websites, that I would encourage you to check out are uh, veg family, which is www.vegfamily.com, and another one called Vegetarian Baby and Child, really comprehensive website. That website is www.vegetarianbaby.com, but it's for toddlers, it's for children, it's for all ages, but the URL is vegetarianbaby.com, and those same people also run vegetarianteen.com. So that's a great website for lots of information. So there's lots of information and resources, book reviews, video reviews, and a lot of books and videos are coming out these days about specifically compassionate holidays. You know, I've seen some wonderful books about um, compassionate Thanksgiving, and I'll remember to mention more of these in, in some subsequent episodes. And there's tips and suggestions and forums and lots of great stuff on all of these websites. So do check them out. So once your kids understand this, once they understand what it means to make kind choices, they can be part of the process of helping to pick through the candy they receive to get rid of the non-vegan candy. Now, I say this with a disclaimer. If your child is at an age when it would be an ordeal to actually put candy in front of them that you're going to remove, then just do it before they get to it. You're the parent. You're not harming them. You're not denying them or depriving them. We're talking about candy. And if they had an allergy to certain foods, you would have no problem doing the same thing. You would go through the pile and you would remove the undesirables, right? I also think it's helpful if you talk to them in advance about the routine. When they understand that the values you're instilling reflect compassion for animals, they actually take this on as their own ethic. That's the whole point of parenting children. You are basically teaching them your ethics. You're teaching them the ethics you want to instill in them. And especially if you've been consistent and truthful from the start, they won't want the non-vegan stuff. I have many vegan friends with kids who've been raised vegan and they just know how to ask for things like, does it have cow's milk in it? And it's really cute because sometimes they ask if it has 
cows does it have cows in it so they get it just tell them that the rules are not to eat the candy until they get home which frankly is what my parents did anyway and this wasn't for vegan reasons this was just to make sure that they could go through the candy and you can also be with them if you're with them trick-or-treating you can certainly let them pick out a piece of candy to eat you can just you know, check to make sure that the one they picked was vegan and you can keep trick or treating. So, th but you can, but you can tell them that the general rule is not to eat the candy until they get home. Big deal. The other thing you can do, if you're afraid that there will be a scene by your removing the candy that they won't get to have, is have alternatives at home. You can do this either way, even if there's not going to be a scene. Just, you know, if there's going to be a lot of Milky Ways or something like other chocolate that has cow's milk in it, then you can plan on having some vegan chocolate candy at home. So after you've removed the non-vegan chocolate candy, they can swap it out for the vegan chocolate that you've bought. And being vegan chocolate, it will be much yummier and much healthier since there's no cow's milk in it. So just get, you know, dark or semi-sweet uh, chocolate. It's also helpful to know in advance what you will do with the candy that you don't want. And again, your kid can be part of this process. You can bring it to your workplace or you can throw it away. And I don't mind if I'm accused of being wasteful for making that suggestion. This is not nutritious food that would otherwise nourish a little body somewhere. It's sugar and it's cheap junk. So personally, I don't think it's something to pass off to others, but that's just my opinion. If you want to give it to other kids or neighbors, then that's completely up to you. That's fine. Also, if you can trick or treat with other vegan parents and kids, that's always a nice way for your children to feel like they're not the only ones. And I know this isn't always possible, but I do think it's important for vegan kids to have other animal conscious or other vegan people, kids or adults in their life so that they have other people they can relate to. Even if you watch a video or if you know a celebrity who's vegan, you know, if you obviously know of celebrities who are vegan, you can just point them out and say they're vegan too. It's just, I think it really helps for them to understand that there are a lot of other people out there like them. So vegan kids can enjoy Halloween just as much as any other vegan kid. Do not fret about it. And again, for the kids, yes, it's about the candy, but it's also about the quest. It's about the excitement of going from house to house and collecting the booty. It's about dressing up in exotic or scary costumes and it's about being with friends and having fun. So try and put an emphasis on these things more than on the candy. And besides, these days, Halloween parties seem to have replaced trick-or-treating anyway. So you can also have a Halloween party. You can obviously make it a costume party. And this is not just for kids. My husband's birthday is around Halloween. So a few years ago, I threw a surprise party for him. And we made it a full-on costume party with prizes and everything. We made it a lot of fun. We put a stereo outside that played a loop of scary voices and noises and music. We put fake cobwebs all over the house. We was a friend who helped me, by the way. And we put a big punch bowl in a bucket of dry ice so it looked like smoke, you know, like really silly Halloween-y things like that. So a Halloween party is not just for kids, but you can do all of the same things for them. There are a million vegan snack food options for the party, including familiar standbys such as vegetables and dip, fruit skewers, nuts, potato chips, hummus and pitas, tortilla chips and guacamole. For a kid's party, you can also serve veggie dogs and veggie burgers or vegan pizza. The options are absolutely endless. You can serve, obviously, you have to serve apple cider or make a Halloween punch of some kind. You can have the kids make things at the party like popcorn balls or other fun Halloween-y type snack foods such as like chocolate cupcakes with orange frosting and black sprinkles. You can stick little plastic Halloween toys in the top like spiders or pumpkins and or ghosts. Another thing you can serve or help the kids make um, is chocolate covered fruit. You just get dried fruit like dried sliced pineapple or pears or apricots or anything or fresh fruit as well. And you just, you know, boil some, do a double boiler, make a double boiler and just melt the chocolate, either dark or semi-sweet chocolate. And then you just get a fork or a dipping fork or a toothpick and you stick half of the fruit into the chocolate and you swirl it around and then you lift it up and let the excess drip back onto um, even other dried fruit. You know, you can have the chocolate be stuck into another piece of dried fruit. So, so that's just a really yummy dessert you can have at any time but it's especially nice for a party. You can carve pumpkins together or at the party, the kids can decorate their own little pumpkins. Um, of course, bobbing for apples. Obviously, I used to bob for apples. That's something I did when I was a kid, although when I look back on it, it totally freaked me out. I really don't relish the idea of sticking my head in a bucket of water, but if you want, you can do bobbing for apples. 
you can turn your house into a haunted house or you can turn your backyard into a haunted house or something like that. And you can also, for older kids, just rent scary movies and serve popcorn. So there's lots of things you can do. And as I said, I celebrate this time of year in many ways, but I also use trick-or-treating as an opportunity for advocacy. Every moment, every interaction is an opportunity for advocacy. So I've been known to hand out vegan literature friendly vegan literature to trick-or-treaters along with things that are clearly vegan treats one year trick-or-treaters who came to our door received primal strips there's a um really tasty vegan versions of jerky you know like beef jerky or whatever stuff they sell in convenience stores i never ate that stuff when i did eat animals but we were taking a drive up to farm sanctuary a few years ago with some friends and these friends brought the primal strips along as a snack and one of my friends convinced me to try some. And as you know, I really tend to eat mostly whole foods and I tend not to eat this kind of thing, but she gave me a bite of the hot and spicy shiitake, which was just really good. So I got a bunch of those for Halloween one year and I handed them out with like, I don't know, vegan outreaches, try vegetarian booklets or something like that. Look, every moment, every interaction is an opportunity. It's just an opportunity to plant some seeds. And um, and by the way, if you are interested in checking out Primal Strips, you can go to my Amazon store, go to CompassionateCooks.com, click on Stock Your Pantry, and you'll find them there. The shiitake mushroom really is fantastic, but it's a little spicy. So if you don't like spicy, don't say I didn't warn you. The teriyaki flavor is also really good. So they're there at the store if you want to try them. Otherwise, you'll find them at other vegan stores online or at your local health food store. So if you'd like to hand out things other than candy and, and use it as an opportunity to plant seeds, here are some suggestions for things to grace trick-or-treaters with. You can hand out message stickers. Farm Sanctuary has some really, really cute stickers. Uh, I just picked some up myself. The I really like these because they're, they have really sweet messages on them about animals, but they're actual photos of some of the beautiful animals at Farm Sanctuary in New York and in California. They're not cutesy cartoon pictures of animals, although you could find those as well. You can hand out message buttons like my Be Kind to Animals Don't Eat Them buttons. I sell them for a dollar for each button in packs of five. But if you don't want to give them out to trick-or-treaters, if you get a lot of trick-or-treaters and that's too expensive, you can always hand them away as favors, party favors. And I have eight different designs and colors now. They're really cute. There's a goat, a turkey, a lamb, a calf, a bunny, a chick, a fish, and some pigs. And a couple of these animals, a few of these animals are actually from Farm Sanctuary, and I know these animals. So they're really beautiful photographs of, of, of animals, and they say, be kind to animals, don't eat them. And that's, a, I think, a lovely message for people to get at Halloween. You can buy a couple boxes of Sunflower Baking Company's mini cookies, which are fabulous vegan and gluten-free cookies in a number of different flavors. And the cookies are all individually wrapped. So you give them away and people get home and they eat these delicious cookies. But because they're individually wrapped, you'll also be promoting a vegan cookie and a vegan company at the same time. So go to sunflowerbaking.com. That's sun, S-U-N, flower, F as in Frank, L O U R baking.com flour, like, you know, wheat flour, sunflower baking.com. You can also get really yummy chocolate from Chocolate Decadence. Uh, they have uh, lots of chocolate that's in little shapes, like, shapes that are appropriate for different holidays or occasions, including Halloween. So they have different shapes of like witches and pumpkins and ghosts and other things. You can hand out Why Vegan, you know, or or Vegan Outreach's Guide to Cruelty-Free Living or Try Vegetarian. Just add it right to their bag, though it definitely helps to hand out some treats as well. You can burn some CDs of my podcast, right? Uh, you can hand those out. And actually, I've been asked about this a lot lately. If anyone out there does have the desire to help me burn CDs of the podcast. A lot of people don't have access to a computer or the internet. And, you know, surprisingly, a lot of people don't know what a podcast is. Um, and certainly they don't own an MP3 player. So this is something I'd really love to, to, to do more and be able to give people access to the podcast who, who don't know what a podcast is. Uh, you can also get other animal and vegan oriented DVDs or CDs that you can burn and give out. And if you go this route, even with my podcast, I would encourage you to label the CD or the DVD in such a way that actually portrays what it is. You know, I'm not suggesting that you trick anybody, but you can do this in a fun, upbeat way to encourage them to watch or listen to something that might change the way they think. 
On another note, you can just hand out other types of treats and things like fruit leather or licorice, little bags of organic pretzels or potato chips or corn chips, little boxes of animal cookies, small boxes of raisins. You can also create your own little vegan baggies of things that you get from the bulk bin of your natural food store like dark chocolate covered nuts or chocolate covered raisins or chocolate covered pretzels. You can include dried fruits and dates or dates stuffed with almonds. And there's a recipe for that in my cookbook, although it's really easy. You just take out the pit and put it in almond. You and toast the almond first. I think that's actually a lot better if you toast the almond first. You can make baked goods that, you know, homemade baked goods, but I don't, I don't know if people are still reluctant to give their kids or let their kids eat the homemade treats. There, you know, there've been a lot of scares since the 1980s and most of these were unfounded, but there have been some real incidents of people tampering with Halloween candy and apples and stuff. But anyway, those are my suggestions. Take them or leave them. One last thing I want to say before I leave Halloween is, you know, unfortunately, there are many reports around this time of year of cats, specifically black cats, black and white cats, and even gray cats being tortured and killed. The perception of danger to black cats on Halloween has become so prevalent that many shelters and humane societies rightfully refuse to allow adoption of black cats during the entire month of October. Another reason shelters don't adopt out black cats this time of year is because it has not been uncommon for people to adopt, quote unquote, black cats and then use them for Halloween decoration or whatever and then return them to the shelter. So if you do let your cat outside, I do recommend that in the days leading up to Halloween and certainly the night of Halloween that you keep your kitty inside, no matter what her color. And despite some sadistic incidents that take place around Halloween, you know, a friend of mine who runs a local shelter here, she told me, I was shocked to find this out. She told me that black cats are the least adopted cats of all, even the tuxedo cats. I really had no idea that these superstitions are that pervasive, but they are. They actually organize special adoption days just for black cats and tuxedo cats and gray cats. It's so sad. My two boys are black tuxedo cats they have you know white paws and white bellies and white ch they're gorgeous I mean they're just absolutely beautiful cats but I will stop now because this episode will become all about Simon and Schuster and you won't be able to stop me so if it isn't clear by now making a transition from an animal-based diet to a plant-based diet is so much more than about changing food choices. It's it's so much more about changing the way we think, shifting the paradigms, questioning our assumptions, and realigning our values with our behavior. And it might seem overwhelming when I put it this way, when I say that it's all this kind of huge mind shift, but our old way of thinking is very cumbersome if you think about it. It's very limiting. When you begin to experience the shift, when you begin to experience that awakening, you really do feel like you're casting off a very heavy weight. Old patterns may be familiar, but familiar isn't always good. Familiar can mean complacency. Familiar can be stale. Familiar can be static. Familiar can be deadly. Remember the short story, The Lottery? If you haven't read it in a while, go reread it or listen to my podcast episode by the same name. That's what an attachment to traditions and rituals can do to you. When it comes to rituals and traditions, embrace what works for you. Embrace what reflects your values and discard the rest. That's what we do already anyway. So let's not think it's any different just because we're looking at it through the lens of veganism and compassion and animal rights. It's no different. We pick and choose all the time which rituals we follow and we can choose to make the foundation of these rituals and traditions and holidays compassion and and kindness and nonviolence. So I hope these suggestions have helped somewhat. And my hope is that your celebrations are filled with compassion and with abundance. For the animals, this is Colleen with Compassionate Cooks. Thanks for listening. Thank you.